Are we on? Good evening. On behalf of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, I'm happy to welcome you to this evening's talk in our Dialogues of Discovery series. Um, tonight, we'll hear from Professor Liz Spelke, who's a professor of psychology at Harvard. She'll talk to us about a subject that she's been working on for 30 years, something that we all personally experience, how infants learn about the world. So I don't want to take any more of Liz's time. You have this lovely little brochure that tells you all about her work and her career. So I'm not going to repeat all that information. I'm just going to welcome Liz to come up and present her talk. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, thanks to everybody who met with me today, uh, from the great scientists to the high school students. Uh, it's been totally uh, fun and stimulating, and I've learned a lot. So uh, thank you all for that. Um, what I want to do today in this talk uh, is address one general question. The question is, what is it about our species and only our species that makes our thinking and our learning so fast and flexible and inventive. Uh, now, one thing that makes this, I think, kind of puzzling, but also focuses the question, is that our brains and our basic cognitive functions we've discovered uh, uh, over uh, the last decades, uh, half century of research uh, in neuroscience, are really strikingly similar to those of other animals. That's why we can learn so much about human vision through studies of animals like cats and why we can learn so much about human navigation and memory uh, and um, uh, planning through studies of animals like rodents, and why we can learn so much about decision making uh, through studies of animals like monkeys, and I learned today uh, also through studies of animals like flies. So we can learn a great deal from studying other animals because fundamentally we're built like them. Uh, and built to learn about the world and to function in the world the ways that, that they do. But that only raises more strongly this mystery that we seem to take these abilities that we share with other animals into new territory that no other animal out there uh, can even imagine. We build whole new systems of knowledge, and each of those systems is centered on abstract concepts, systems that make us capable of things like art, technology, measurement of uh, space and time, uh, conventional systems like money, uh, and then shared um, uh, systems of knowledge that just keeps advancing like mathematics and science, uh, and systems we care about perhaps the most, systems like ethics. All of these things are present in every human society. But they're also highly variable from one culture to another. And that, I think, raises two questions. First of all, from their universality, we can ask, what is it that allows us as a species, and only our species, to develop these universal, abstract, new systems? But second, from the fact that they're so variable from one culture to another, we can ask, what kind of prodigious learning capacity must a young child have in order to be capable of being born into any human society and in a few short years come to master uh, the systems of knowledge uh, that structure that society? How are children able to learn so rapidly? Well, I'm not going to answer any of these uh, questions. What I want to do today, though, uh, is share with you my best attempt at an answer, uh, the general form of an answer that I think has the best chance at this point of being true. Uh, and it's an answer that comes in two parts. First, the first part is I think that all of our knowledge, even our knowledge of ethics and science and mathematics at its highest reaches, depends on cognitive systems that are ancient that we share with a wide range of other animals that emerge early in human development, so we share them with human infants, and each of which uh, centers on a set of interconnected abstract concepts. When we reason at the highest levels, we're calling on abstract concepts that begin to function in us very early in life and that function in other animals as well. So that's part one. Part two, 
I think we build new systems of knowledge, not by uh, developing whole new domains out of whole cloth, uh, gaining something out of nothing, but rather by combining uh, the concepts that come from core knowledge, the concepts that come from the early developing ancient systems that we share with other animals, and combining them in a uniquely human way, productively, to create infinite series of new concepts that we can envisage, envisage without having learned piecemeal uh, about them one uh, after another. And I think this productive combinatorial capacity comes from the one cognitive function that seems to be unique to our species, uh, indisputably so, namely the faculty of natural language. So what I want to do in this talk today, it's a talk in three parts. Uh, the first and longest part, uh, I want to ask what is it that infants know early in development uh, and introduce you to the systems of core knowledge. Then I want to ask how children learn and introduce you to this hypothesis that that learning depends on the acquisition of a productive uh, natural language. And finally, I want to step back and ask, why is this still a hypothesis? What can we do to actually make progress on developing a deeper understanding of our fast and flexible learning capacities and our productively combinatorial uh, minds. So the first two uh, thirds of this talk are going to be looking back at what we've already learned. Uh, the first talk looking back at what we've learned. The second part kind of speculating on how we may, uh, what may be unique to us. And the third part looking ahead and asking how can we actually put flesh on those uh, speculations and um, uh, come to discover, uh, more, uh, develop a deeper understanding of human minds. OK, so what do infants know? Uh, I tried to put everything into a single slide. Let's see if I manage. I think there are six basic systems of uh, knowledge that we have evidence for emerging uh, in infancy. One is a system of knowledge about objects and their motions, inanimate objects and their motions, uh, a kind of intuitive physics. Another is a system of knowledge about agents and their actions. A third, a system of knowledge uh, about social beings. In the case of humans, we think of them as persons, individuals who are like us, who have experiences like us, with whom we can engage and communicate. The fourth is a system of knowledge of places, which we use for navigating uh, through uh, spatial layouts, places and their geometric relationships. The fifth, a system of knowledge about forms uh, uh, and their geometric properties that we use for purposes of categorizing objects. Uh, and the final one, a system of knowledge of number. Now, I think all six of these systems center on distinct, abstract, interconnected uh, properties. And I'll give you some uh, examples of those. But all of them, when we study them in infants, and I think when we study them in other animals, turn out to be rather sharply limited. And those limits are useful because they allow us uh, to look for those systems across different animals and also across people of different ages. And when we do that, I think we discover uh, that each of the systems that we find, each of these six systems that we find in human infants also exist in other animals. None of them are unique to us. Uh, that, uh, it follows from that that these systems have been around in the living world much longer than our own species has, that they evolved uh, in distant ancestors common to us and to um, uh, other animals. Uh, using other animals then as models, we can do controlled rearing experiments and discover that these systems are innate. That is to say, they're present and functional on first encounters with the objects that they serve to represent. So um, the very first time an infant encounter, say an infant chick encounters an object, uh, having been rolled and uh, raised uh, previously under controlled conditions with no exposure to objects, they already expect it to behave in the ways that human infants expect it uh, uh, to behave. Um, and the systems remain present throughout life. We can use their, their, uh, their properties and their limits to look for these systems in adults and discover that they're still functioning in us the way they function in infants and in other animals. Finally, there's evidence that each of these systems connects in some way, some way that we need to understand much better, to our uniquely human 
uh, cognitive uh, achievements. So uh, an infant's uh, intuitive approximate sense of number, for example, um, is predictive of their later uh, learning of uh, formal mathematics in school. And as they start to learn formal mathematics in school, if you give them activities that exercise that intuitive sense that they've had since infancy, they perform that, uh, those mathematical, uh, they solve those mathematical problems a little bit better. So somehow these systems are uh, connected to each other. Well, if I had four hours to talk to you tonight and uh, you guys had the patience to listen, I would tell you about all these systems and I would tell you about all these properties, uh, but time being finite, uh, what I want to do in this talk uh, to give you a sense of uh, how we study core knowledge and what we've uh, learned about it is to focus just on three of these six systems and just on two of the properties. Uh, the uh, interconnected abstract concepts at the center of each of these systems and the limitations of these systems that prove so useful in figuring out how to trace them into the brain, how to discover them in other animals, uh, and so forth. So let me start with the um, system for representing objects uh, and also start by introducing you to some of the methods that we use in these studies. Now, I've spent the whole day today uh, meeting with scientists here where I have learned about breathtaking, staggering methods for discovering how cognitive and brain systems work. Amazing methods. In that context, you can't begin to imagine how low-tech and primitive the methods of all the experiments that I'm going to be telling you about on infants are. Uh, what we call an infant experiment, uh, a parent coming into our studies might call a pleasant afternoon in somebody's living room. It's not quite like that. We do put uh, the babies in a controlled laboratory environment. We control rather strictly the displays that we allow them to see. But other than that, our methods are totally low tech. We present ordinary arrays of objects or events, or these days, um, nice, realistic-looking, computer-generated animations of objects uh, and events. And we observe infants' naturally occurring behavior in relation to them. Now, many of the studies rely on looking time uh, for the simple reason that looking around the world is something babies are capable of doing from day one. Uh, by conducting looking time experiments, we can ask what infants know about objects uh, uh, in the first days of life, uh, uh, close to their first encounters with you know, the, begin the, the very onset of um, uh, their visual experience. Although most of the studies that I'll talk about use babies that are two or three or four months of age. They've been looking around for a while. Their visual acuity is getting a little bit better. Uh, but they're still not reaching for things. And they're certainly nowhere near the point where they're going to start talking to other people and learning about the world um, indirectly uh, through others. So what kind of experiments can we do? Here's an example of one. We can present babies with an array in which an object moves as that object's just moved. I'll do it again. Uh, continuously uh, disappearing behind the first of two screens, then reappearing between the screens, and then dis uh, disappearing again and reappearing at the end of the display. Now, these are similar to um, displays that were studied by the Swiss psychologist Jean Piaget, who claimed by looking at infants' patterns of reaching for objects uh, that babies actually were unaware of objects when they go out of sight, that babies simply were aware of what's immediately visible to them, which would imply that a display like the one I just showed you involved three different object appearances, one to the left of the two screens, one between them, and one to the right. Uh, our question was, is that actually what babies are seeing? If we ask them in a different way that doesn't require that they act on objects in a coordinated manner. So to do this, we presented one group of babies uh, repeatedly with events that I, the event that I just showed you, except it, it moved back and forth continuously, the object be uh, behind uh, the, the two screens. Uh, so they saw that. It continued for as long as they wanted to look at it. Um, that was half the babies. The other half the babies saw this event. Exactly the same on the two uh, sides of the screen, but no object moved through the center of the display. And what did we do with the babies to, to uh, discover what they saw? We tried to bore them to death. Uh, not, to, not to death, actually. We tried to bore them, quite thoroughly bore them, uh, by presenting the same back and forth motion again and again uh, until their looking time declined. And typically, this would take something like six, six pres each presentation lasting until they look away. Uh, it would take about six, between six and 12 presentations for the baby's looking time to go down to half or less 
of its initial level. And now to ask, what did babies perceive, perceive in these arrays? Uh, we can ask, what will their boredom generalize to? And what will make them perk up? What will they see as a change? And therefore, something more interesting. So to get at this, we presented these displays with the objects moving back and forth in one or the other of these patterns, ending the display with the object moving behind one of the two screens and stopping, so that all that was visible in the array was the two screens. And now, we took those screens away, uh, and in alternation, presented the babies with, uh, uh, with an array consisting of just one object behind the two screens, or two objects behind the two screens. And the question was, which of these events would babies find more interesting? And the finding was that the babies who saw the single object moving continuously back and forth were more interested in the array of two objects, and the babies who saw the uh, the object motion on the two sides with no motion in the middle were more interested in the array of uh, one object. Now, that's suggesting that these infants are, their perceptions are not corresponding to what's simply visible in the array. Rather, they seem to be tracking a single continuously moving but intermittently visible object uh, on the left and two distinct objects on the right. Now, that's a looking time experiment. But we get more confident about conclusions like this when we discover that other naturally occurring uh, behaviors provide evidence for the same ability. So here's a study that was conducted by uh, Lisa Feigenson, a cognitive scientist at um, Johns Hopkins University. And it involved uh, equally low-tech studies involving a simple opaque box, a ball, and a hand. There, there were, as in the um, uh, looking time study, there were two conditions to this experiment, which I'm imperfectly animating here. Uh, in both of them, uh, uh, a person came in holding the ball, showed the ball to the infant, and then moved their hand and the ball into the box. Then they took their hand out of the box, and it reappeared holding another ball, and they moved that hand and ball into the box. The critical thing that differed between the two conditions of this experiment is what was the state of the hand when it was removed from the box the first time. And in one condition, what happened was the following. Hand went in, uh, holding a ball, came out empty, went in, holding a ball, uh, came out empty a second time. So there should be two objects in there. In the other condition, the hand went in, holding the ball, came out, holding the ball, went in again, holding the ball, and came out empty. So there should be one object in there. Logically, it's the same as the study, the looking time study. But now, the task for infants was to search the box. And the measure was, how long would they search? So all of the babies went into the box and retrieved one object. Now, the devious experimenters had set things up so that there was only ever one object in the box at that point. The question was, would the babies go back to search for a second object? And if so, how persistently would they search? And the babies who had seen the, the hand the first time come out empty searched more persistently for a second object in the box than the one who saw the uh, object appear three times, like in the continuous motion condition above. So bottom line, both infant spontaneous looking and their reaching uh, observed under these controlled contrasting conditions that differed only in this one single parameter of what's happening between the two um, ob uh, beginning and ending object appearances, I think provides evidence uh, that these infants represented these objects as moving on spatiotemporally continuous paths as existing uh, continuously, and they used this, uh, these representations to infer that there were two objects participating in one set of these events and one object um, participating in uh, the other. So that's one example of an experiment providing evidence for uh, a cognitive capacity in infants, a cognitive capacity which is not unique to infants. This has been shown in chicks, for example, uh, as well. Uh, and in um, uh, a bunch of monkeys and other animals as well. Here, here very quickly are a few other things that uh, ways in which infants are able to uh, represent objects. Here's a much simpler situation. Suppose you present infants with two objects, one sitting on top of another, and you set the top object in motion, uh, but motion that never causes it to spatially separate from the other object. It just slides on top of it. 
Uh, both looking time experiments and reaching experiments provide evidence that that pattern of relative motion uh, leads infants to infer that there's two objects in this array. For example, they expect that if a hand were to come out and lift the top object, the top object would move by itself. Whereas in a contrasting condition in which both objects move together, they expect the two objects to move together into the air. Incidentally, they expect the top object to move by itself not only when it moves and the bottom object stays, stays, stays stationary, which is what I showed you here, but in the opposite case where the top object is stationary and the bottom object moves under, underneath it. In either of those cases, infants seem to use the relative motion to infer uh, that two separate objects happen to be adjacent to each other, uh, but there's two separate bounded objects in this array. Uh, I think this shows sensitivity to a basic uh, uh, property uh, that infants endow objects with, the property of cohesiveness, namely that an object is an interconnected whole and it will move as a whole. If you grasp an object and lift it, the whole object will come as a single uh, cohesive body. Okay, I'm going too slowly here, let me speed up. Um, infants also, th th that was a case where they use relative motion to perceive object boundaries. Infants will also use common motion to perceive the continuity of an object over occlusion. So if the top and bottom, oops, sorry. If the top and bottom of an object move together back and forth behind an occluder, infants will infer that they're connected and they'll look longer if you remove the occluder and show a gap uh, uh, between the two objects. Infants infer that objects will be solid and, and therefore two things cannot be in the same place at once. So if they see a screen rotating upward, fully uh, occluding an object, they expect that screen to stop rotating when it reaches the location that that object behind it is occupying. And if instead the, the screen continues rotating till it's lying flat on the table, the babies look longer. That's not what they anticipated. And finally, if infants see events involving two objects in which one object was partly visible initially stationary behind a screen and then a second object moved behind the, uh, behind the screen fully out of view and the, and the first initially stationary object starts to move, infants infer that the two objects made contact behind the occluder, that the moving object hit the stationary object and set it in motion. Now interestingly, it's been shown that these aren't simply separate independent properties that infants um, attribute to objects. Rather, they're interconnected. That is to say, if you show infants, if you introduce infants to a new object and you show that it violates one of these general uh, properties, it lacks one of these general properties, they no longer expect it to have the other properties. These properties are inter, uh, interconnected. They also develop early. Some of them have been shown in newborn infants, most in two-month-old infants, and I think just about all of them have been shown in controlled reared chicks. So these are ways, uh, expectations about objects that developing brains can come to hold uh, and uh, exhibit on first encounter with a visible object in the um, uh, external world. Now, uh, lest you think that babies are brilliant and can do uh, everything, let me um, emphasize that infants' abilities to represent objects are rather sharply limited. And to save time, I'm going to give you only an example of just one limit to their representations, but there's many others that I could have talked about. Basically, all of our abilities to look around a stationary world and see it as a meaningful array of bottles and pens and computers and people we have no evidence that infants, uh, well, people maybe, but for the other categories, we have no evidence that infants have any of uh, those um, uh, abilities. They can represent these abstract properties of objects like their cohesiveness, their continuity over time, uh, but nothing about the particular kinds of objects and their functional properties that we take for granted um, as adults. So here's an example of a task that infants fail. In this task, like the ones I showed you at the beginning with the objects with the two occluders, uh, it's a variation on that task, but now there's just one screen in the array, not two. And instead of having two featurely indistinguishable objects appearing on the two sides of the screen, you have two objects appearing on the two sides of the screen that have different shapes, they have different colors, they have somewhat different textures, and they belong to different meaningful kinds. These are toys that are very well known uh, to infants by maybe six months of age maximum, okay? Uh, these are familiar objects for infants. So what happens in this event is there's a big screen, 
a hand reaches behind it and comes out with a duck on one side and then puts it back behind the screen. Then a hand reaches behind the other side, comes out with a ball, and puts that back behind the screen. And the question for the infants is how many objects are there by removing the screen and alternately presenting both objects or only one of them and looking to see how long infants will look. Now, in contrast to the studies I described before, infants' response in this situation is utterly agnostic between one and two. They look equally at the events involving one object and two objects, increasing their looking to both of them as if they didn't know what was going to be behind that screen. At least they didn't know which of those two options it was going to be. And so they're getting new information when you uh, remove the screen and show that both objects are there or that only one of the objects is there. Uh, that's at 10 months of age and below. Between 10 and 12 months, infants start uh, to expect to see uh, two objects behind that screen. So a 12-month-old will look longer if there's just one object there. Uh, but a 10-month-old or a 6-month-old will not, okay? Um, now, you might think the problem here is a memory problem. Kids can't remember after the first object goes behind the screen what its properties were. So when the second one comes out, they don't know whether it's different or not. Now, a number of findings in these studies show that that's not the case. Um, that actually infants do remember that there are featural changes in the events where the objects are moving in, in and out of view. But one way of showing that memory isn't the problem is to show that infants also fail a task that doesn't require any such memory at all. Suppose you just take two meaningful objects. In this case, the ones they happen to use were uh, a toy, the same toy duck, but sitting on a truck, and ask now the question we asked about the objects that were adjacent but underwent relative motion. Uh, how many objects are in this array? Is there one or is there two? And asking the question by grabbing the duck by its head, lifting it into the air, and alternating trials where the duck moved on its own and the truck stayed stationary with trials where the duck and truck moved into the air together. And at 12 months, infants expect the duck to move separately from the truck. They see them as separate objects. But at 10 months and younger, they don't. Okay. Now you could ask, why, why are they having that problem? Is the problem that they're failing to recognize that the duck is a duck and the truck is a truck when they're adjacent? Well, uh, the people who did these studies, uh, Fei Xu and Susan Carey, uh, presented pretty compelling evidence that that was not the case by showing videos of some of the infants who would look at this array and go quack, quack, or vroom, vroom, quite clearly showing they recognized, here's a toy truck that I could play with. But they didn't use that information uh, to determine where one object ended and the next began. Uh, so these uh, uh, features of the objects and their functions are detected and they're used in play, but the infants don't seem to be using them to divide up the world into bodies with these abstract properties of cohesiveness, persistence over time, uh, and so forth. Um, so that's what we see when we present infants with inanimate objects. But one of the key uh, take-home messages from all the research I'll be talking about on infants is that infants don't just have one way of understanding the world, uh, that they apply to everything. Rather, they have distinct systems for solving different cognitive problems. Because although they seem to be oblivious to forms and features when you present them with inanimate objects, the story changes quite considerably if instead you present them with objects that have the features of uh, animate beings. So let me switch uh, from core knowledge of objects uh, to core knowledge of agents uh, who act on the world and cause changes in the world uh, by generating uh, their own motion. Now from birth, when you present babies with objects that have faces, or objects that have bodies, or objects that engage in biological motion, Babies do not treat them the way they treat inanimate objects. Uh, they uh, seem to make sense of their behavior and reason about them in quite um, uh, a different way. So how do they reason about them? Here, very quickly, I hope I'll be quick enough, um, are a few examples. First of all, infants endow agents with the power to cause their own motion. So uh, this is a study uh, in which infants were shown a party trick object. It's an animal ball, the one you see in that middle photograph there. Some of you have maybe seen this object. Uh, the ball has a mechanism inside it that leads this thing, when it's been wound up, to move in a very irregular pattern. It kind of looks like a squirrel scurrying around. So babies get to see that. And the question that the experimenters asked the baby is, what do you think is causing the motion here? 
And the way they ask that question is both before and after presenting the animal ball in motion, they take another copy of the animal ball, rip it apart into its two separate pieces, and present those pieces stationary on the stage. Now, at the top, you see uh, the first trial of this experiment, where the animal's on one side and the ball's on the other. Neither of them has moved at this point. Um, and the infants look equally at the two of them. They find them about equally interesting. Then in the middle, the infants see them both together, moving together. The actual mechanism of motion is inside the ball, not inside the animal. But when they, again, after that motion, present the two side by side, stationary again, now the infants spend most of their time looking at the animal. Now, why would they do that? It looks like they've attributed, their, their expectation is, if anything is going to move in this array, it's going to be the guy who moved before. Uh, and the one that they think it was the source of the motion was the one that has the animal features. So they're using forms and features of um, animals uh, to infer uh, that this is an agent that can cause its own motion. I didn't succeed in going more quickly on that one. Let me see if I can do better on this one. So in, once in, uh, infants see an object with features of uh, animals or people, they also infer that the motion of such objects will be goal-directed. Uh, so if you put two objects on a scene and show a hand reaching for one of them, and then you reverse the positions of the two objects, you bore infants with that event, and then reverse the positions of the two objects and ask, what do they find more boring, a reach on the same trajectory or a reach to the same object? The more boring event is the reach to the same object, providing evidence that they're perceiving these reaches as object-directed. All you have to do, though, is switch out that hand and instead present an inanimate object like an, a broom, and that effect goes away. It's only with animate objects uh, that you see it. Infants have other expectations about objects. They expect them to act efficiently. So if a person reaches on a curvilinear trajectory to get to an object behind a barrier, and the barrier is removed, they don't expect the next reach to be curvilinear. They expect it to be direct um, and linear, uh, as efficient as the conditions allow. Uh, infants also make different expectations about contact relations between animate objects. So um, I told you that if two inanimate objects move in sequence behind a, a screen, infants infer that the first object contacted the second. They also make that inference if the first object to go behind uh, is animate, but the second is inanimate. They infer that that inanimate object will only start to move if the animate object hits it. However, if both objects are animate, they do not expect uh, that the second one is going to wait for the first one to slam into them before they start to move. So they don't apply contact uh, to animate objects under those conditions. And finally, infants seem to be sensitive to the conditions under which uh, an agent uh, is able to detect other things and direct goal-directed actions to other things in the environment. And in particular, if an object stands behind a, a screen such that the infant can see it, but that agent cannot, uh, then infants do not expect the uh, agent to uh, plan actions directed to that object. They only expect them to act on objects that are uh, visually accessible to them. Now, these properties are interconnected. I could illustrate that with some of these experiments, but instead I want to tell you about just one experiment from my lab. I think it's the only one I'm going to be talking about tonight, um, and take you through it in detail. Um, it's a relatively new study, and uh, it illustrates, I think, two points about agent representations. One, that they depend on um, uh, attributing to agents properties that are abstract, and two, that those properties are systematically interconnected. But without saying any more, uh, let me put you in the role of an infant in these experiments, which uh, uh, are entirely the work of um, my wonderful student, Sherry Liu. Here's the study. OK, so here's what you saw. You saw t uh, four events. In two of them, the central red character was summoned uh, by the blue guy. In two of them, uh, he was summoned by the yellow guy. Uh, in one event each, he uh, 
uh, responded to that summons and approached the guy, and in one event each he didn't. Uh, his motions were otherwise the same. His vocalizations were otherwise the same. The critical difference between the two conditions, he was willing to undertake a costlier action uh, for the yellow guy than for the blue guy. Question, does he have a preference between these two guys? Uh, uh, will infants expect him to prefer to value one of them uh, more than the other? Well, to get at that, after presenting, uh, familiarizing infants with those uh, four events, infants for the first time were presented with the red character with both uh, of the two uh, potential uh, goal characters visible. The red character looked back and forth between the two of them, and on alternating tri uh, trials, uh, uh, he approached one or the other. Question, which of these was expected? Which of them was unexpected? By infant's looking time, we inferred that the unexpected one was the event in which he chose to approach the character for which he had taken the less costly action. Okay. Um, now, this study in itself uh, says there's some, rela some relationship between what we as adults would describe as the cost of an agent's action um, and the preference that the infant attributes to that object. But if all I told you about was the results of this experiment, you might imagine that infants, especially these infants, um, who I guess I didn't uh, uh, put this on the slide, these infants are relatively old. They're 10 months of age. We're now repeating these experiments with younger uh, infants and not yet... Um, uh, I think they're going to work, but uh, we, uh, we're, uh, those studies are still in progress. So these are 10-month-old infants. Perhaps they've learned a rule like um, objects that are more highly valued, goal, when goal objects are more highly valued, agents will travel longer distances to get to them because path length is different in these cases. Or they'll move more quickly to get to them because we equated for the total duration of motion across these events, which means the longer paths also involved um, higher uh, speeds. So to get at whether infants were responding to individual perceptual features or whether they had a more abstract and general notion of action cost, we ran two more experiments. Here's the events for one of them. Uh, in these events, uh, in, uh, the character isn't jumping over barriers. He's climbing hills. The hills vary in steepness, but they involve paths of the same length and the same speed. Uh, so if, if, they, if infants learned rules about um, uh, path length or path speed, they would fail those conditions. Uh, now, there is one other perceptual property, though, that they could be using, which is the height to which an agent travels. So we ran a third experiment where height was equated. Now the agent is jumping over trenches of varying width, uh, jumping to equal heights, but at unequal speeds, therefore having to push off on that jump with greater force uh, when they had to clear. Uh, the uh, wider trench. So across these three conditions, there is no single perceptual feature uh, that infants could rely on uh, to, uh, to base a prediction of um, action preferences. But across the three, we see very similar uh, findings. So I think this is beginning to build a case that by 10 months, infants have interconnected abstract uh, concepts of the physical costs uh, of actions and of the values of the goal states that those actions uh, uh, bring about. Maybe something like the beginnings of uh, core capacity for economic reasoning um, uh, and decision making, a capacity uh, that's also very well studied in animals. And I think it'll be exciting to try to connect some of this work on infants with um, animal studies. Uh, but again, as in the case of object representations, there are limits uh, to infants' representations of agents, and I want to talk about um, uh, just uh, two. First of all, infants, although infants are sensitive to what an, is visible from an agent's perspective, they, they're not until very late in development, until the second year, well, late for me, until the second year, um, they're not sensitive to what uh, an agent is actually looking at. They don't use what an agent is looking at to predict what they're going to do. Um, nor do they use the emotion that an agent evinces as, as uh, she looks at one object or another. So if you present an agent with two objects, both of which are perceptually accessible, there's nothing blocking the agent's view of either of them. But the agent only turns and looks at one of them and smiles at that one. Uh, and you ask the infant, in effect, to predict uh, which of these two objects the agent is going to reach for. The infant finds it equally probable that the agent will reach for either of those objects until actually 14 months um, of age. Uh, so 
when people act on objects, young infants seem to understand what's visible to them, but they don't understand what they're looking at, what they're seeing, what they're desiring. Now, that's not because infants are oblivious to gaze or, de or desire, uh, because if you take them out of a context uh, in which agents are acting on objects, and put them instead in a social context in which a person is attempting to engage with them, then they're sensitive to both of these cues. And that's the evidence for the third system and the last one um, I'll talk about uh, infant's uh, 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 core knowledge of uh, the social world. So newborn infants attend uh, to um, uh, the direction of people's gaze when they see a face which is looking straight at them. They'll look longer if the eyes are pointed at them than if the eyes are pointed off to the side. They'll also attend to a, an expression of emotion in a face that's looking directly at them, both when it's expressed by an adult and when it's expressed uh, by an infant. They'll look longer at a smiling face uh, than at um, a fussy face. If you, if you take figures, uh, pictures like those pictures of uh, the, the, the two infants and you play a sound of a voice between them, if the, uh, the infants will match the emotional tone in the voice to the emotional expression on the person's face. So if the voice is fussy, they'll look longer at the fussy face, and if the voice is giggling, they'll look longer at the happy face. Infants also imitate the gestures of their uh, social partners. By the way, uh, these uh, studies have all been done not only with human infants, but also with monkey infants, and most of them have been done with infant chimpanzees. These abilities are not unique um, uh, to humans. Uh, they'll do some rudimentary forms of imitation. And finally, if a person looks straight at the infant and then turns their eyes to the side, infants will continue to look at that person as long as they're visible. But if, they, if that face disappears after the eyes turn to the side, infants move their attention to the same side of space that the person was uh, looking at, showing another form of sensitivity, I think, to other people's uh, looking behavior and to their uh, emotional expressions. Now, these, these findings raise the possibility that there's another system of knowledge at work here, a system for reasoning about the social world, about people not as agents who act on objects, but as social beings who communicate with other social beings and, um, and uh, engage with them. But because the infant himself is doing the reacting in these experiments, they're open to other interpretations. Uh, fortunately, infants also make sense uh, of social interactions that they observe as third parties. And in that case, I think we can get clearer evidence about how they're understanding those interactions. So when infants see movies in which uh, two people engage with each other, they expect them to speak to each other, and they expect that by speaking, uh, their mental states and their behaviors will start to align. Uh, they expect such people to approach each other and to move together. Uh, when presented either with movies of real people or with animated characters accompanied by uh, a voice that includes a baby cry and some adult uh, speech, infants expect the adult to approach a crying baby and to comfort them. Uh, they also, uh, if they're uh, presented with sets of characters who uh, move together, dance together, uh, appear to uh, uh, be socially connected to each other, and they see two of the three characters in a set engage in a given action, they expect the third character to act, uh, uh, undertake the same action. So they expect uh, members of a social group to um, imitate one another. And these predispositions also are all interconnected. So when infants see that one character has imitated another character, they expect that the, the imitating character is more likely to approach the other character uh, to engage with them socially in other ways. And some of uh, these findings have been connected to the infant's own experience. So for example, a recent study using the animated crying baby events where infants see a baby cry uh, and see two other adults present, if those adults are given uh, different gendered voices, one gets a male voice and the other gets a female voice, then the subset of infants who are cared for primarily by females will expect the female, not the male, to be the one uh, who comes down and comforts the baby. Uh, so it looks like uh, by all of these measures, what we're seeing here uh, is the work of a meaningful system for making sense of um, social interactions uh, uh, within um, uh, uh, both with the baby and among uh, other people. And if so, it looks like it might be a system centering on abstract concepts of social engagement and shared experience. 
concepts that are interconnected to each other and distinct from the abstract concepts at the center of the other two systems that I talked about. Now, finally, core knowledge of persons also is limited. So, for example, infants smile at people who imitate their social gestures and their emotional expressions, but they don't smile at people who imitate instrumental actions, just as uh, uh, we don't think two people are being social to each other if they both um, uh, are engaged in the same instrumental task or they both cross the street when the light changes. Uh, infants only interpret uh, uh, imitative behavior as social when it seems like an otherwise purposeless uh, uh, gesture. Now, at five months, infants um, also, uh, you can uh, get uh, expectations of imitation to go away if the imitated actions are, are uh, if you introduce objects into the scenes that make it look as if the goal of the um, action might be uh, to contact an object. And finally, we've done a bunch of studies, and other people have done a bunch of studies of infants' uh, differential social reactions to different people who engage in different forms of social behavior, where the outcome measure is how much does the infant like each of these two characters. And a good way to, to get at that is to present two people side by side and have each of them offer the infant a toy and see who the infant will take that toy from. Now, this method works great for a baby who's 10 months of age. If a person is in front of them who they're feeling wary of, when that person offers a toy, they'll look at the toy, they'll look back up at the person, look at the toy, and some of the babies in our studies actively push the toy away, right? They seem to very clearly understand that a toy offering is a social gesture. That's at 10 months of age. Younger babies don't do that. If two people are offering toys, they'll look back and forth between the two people, they'll look back and forth between the two toys, and they'll grab for one or both uh, of the toys. But they don't seem to connect each toy to the person. So I think for an older infant and for us, a toy, an object offering is a social gesture. But for the younger infant, it seems uh, not to be. I think what all of these limits suggest is that young infants are able to construe other people's behavior in two different ways. They can view people as agents who act on objects, or they can view people as social beings who engage with one another. But they don't seem to view people as doing both of those things at the uh, same time. So if that's right, then what we're seeing here are three distinct and limited but unitary and abstract systems of knowledge. A, a system of knowledge of objects as bodies that move, of agents as um, animate beings who act on the world, and of uh, people as social beings who engage uh, with one another um, and share experiences. What's more, I think this evidence suggests that these systems are not readily combined if you're a young infant. And also, I think, not readily combined if you're a non-human animal. Of course, you can learn to combine them piecemeal. An animal can learn to anticipate that when a person enters a room, some instrumental action will follow. Uh, but that's different from seeing a single action as being both social and object directed at the same time. That's what I think comes in at the end of the first year and isn't there before then. Uh, so. Uh, uh, I've told you about three of the six systems of core knowledge and two of their properties. Now I want to focus on uh, the second question. How do we get to have these uniquely human, fast and flexible learning abilities? I think core, I focused on core knowledge because I think it's part of the answer to that question, but it's clearly not the whole answer. It can't be the whole answer because infants' core concepts are shared by other animals who don't develop any of these uniquely uh, human uh, culture-specific systems. Um, it also can't be the answer because we've seen those core systems are limited, uh, limited in ways in which our thinking about the world is not. And finally, they don't readily combine uh, with one another. Uh, so what makes us such good cultural learners? Well, here's my hypothesis. I think we have a species unique system for composing new concepts from our core concepts uh, by combining them together in accord with uh, productive rules. I think, moreover, that this system is a specific learned natural language. And the ability to form these combinations comes in at the end of the first year because that's the first point at which language learning has progressed to the point where infants can hear expressions of other people as complete sentences that combine uh, words from de uh, that, that refer to entities from uh, uh, different domains. Now, what are the properties of natural language uh, that could uh, underpin uh, this uh, unique, fast, flexible learning that we engage in? I think there are three general properties at work here. 
First, natural languages um, uh, each have a single open-ended stock of words. Uh, all your life, you can learn uh, new words. Most of the people in this room probably learned what a Roomba is before uh, I did. You know that smart robot that cleans your floor for you? Uh, well, if there's anyone in the room who, like me, didn't know what a Roomba is, now that I've told you what it is, you can form infinitely many well-formed, comprehensible sentences using that word. When you get a new word in your vocabulary, uh, once you know the meaning of that word, you get the meanings of all the other words you already know combined with it, the expressions that use those words uh, for free. That gives me the second property of um, natural languages. They consist of rules for forming new expressions based only on the grammatical properties of words, not on their meanings. So you get a new word in your vocabulary. You can enter it into those rules, form new expressions. Um, so languages have not only a lexicon, but a combinatorial syntax. And finally, uh, most importantly, they have a compositional semantics. That is to say, once you know the rules of a language, and the meanings of the individual words, when you combine those words into expressions, uh, the meaning of that expression comes to you for free uh, from knowledge of the rules by which it was formed and the meanings of the individual words that it's composed of. Now, these properties allow children to do something quite remarkable. They allow them to learn words uh, referring to objects in situ or referring to abstract concepts in situations where there's nothing perceptually available uh, to attach those words to, simply from language alone. So imagine a child um, who knows the meaning of the word dog and cat and knows enough of the rules of language to make sense of uh, uh, the rules that generate my example sentence there, who hears someone speak to them and says, I've got, a, I've got two pets, a dog and a cat. There is no dog present. There is no cat present. Uh, yet such a child could go a long way towards figuring out the meaning of the word pet and the meaning of the word to uh, from that sentence alone. This is a key property, I think, of human language. We tend to think that we learn language because people show us things and point to them and label them. But the fact is, if you look at most of the language that we learn, it far outruns what we're able to see, and it far outruns what's been specifically labeled for us. And it's because we can use language uh, to learn language, and we do this all the time. Now, I submit, with no evidence, I have to admit, uh, that we are the only species that learns like this, that those wonderful border collies who've learned 200 words, I'm, I'm betting, have learned them all by extension because someone has shown them the object and given them the label at the same time. But we use the rules of language to go beyond uh, that kind of learning. And I think the same rules that allow us to go beyond that kind of language, language learning also allow us to go beyond the kind of conceptual learning that other animals can engage in and that younger uh, infants can engage in and allow us to combine concepts productively uh, uh, using the rules of, of language to do so. So if that's right, then language learning supports concept learning that's flexible uh, because the combinatorial rules of language uh, generate an infinite set of concepts and because children learn uh, the words and expressions of their language from the people around them who use them in relevant contexts to convey relevant information uh, uh, to them. Now, I just want to mention two developmental changes that I've already brought up with you that happen at the end of the first year that I think this account could explain. Uh, one is the development of an ability to see people uh, as gift givers or as cooperators uh, or as bad social actors uh, who hinder other social actors and therefore um, are uh, blameworthy. Now, these abilities, I think, require that you see people as both capable of instrumental actions causing changes in the world that are directed by social goals. So your goal is to do, do good or do bad towards some other uh, social uh, partner. And I think this ability comes in at the end of the first year when children first come to understand sentences that have both social meaning and object-directed meaning. When someone says, look, a doggy, they're giving you a social invitation to share with them attention to an object. Uh, that kind of invitation, I think, can only be understood by someone who uh, has learned a, a natural language. Um, and it uh, yields a unique perspective on social uh, behavior uh, that emerges, um, I think, at the beginning of the uh, second year. 
The other change uh, is a change that I think underlies our uh, rapid and productive learning about uh, tools. And it comes about when children um, uh, see how other people name objects. So when children see, for example, uh, that people presented with these three objects, will, three of them all having different shapes, will call two of them a cup uh, and the other one a bowl, they're getting information, one, uh, that cups and bowls are distinct from each other, and two, uh, that these are objects that have properties that are interesting enough that I'm worth that, that I'm finding it worthwhile to talk to you about them. And in particular, I think from language like this, children come to uh, connect together representations of objects that come from three distinct systems of core knowledge. Two of the systems I talked about, the system for representing objects, inanimate objects as bodies, um, and the system for representing uh, actions uh, on objects, revealing functional properties of objects like a cup uh, or a bowl. The third system I didn't talk about today, a geometric form system. But I think uh, the intuition that children gain at the beginning of the second year, that just about all of the objects that surround them, and certainly all the objects that people talk about, are mechanical bodies uh, with dedicated functions and forms that serve to fulfill those functions. I think that idea is unique to us as humans uh, and emerges in children at um, this point where they come to uh, master the ways in which uh, adults uh, talk about objects. But you could argue, how could a natural language be a medium for human thought? For one thing, speech and even mental speech is slow, but thought seems to be really fast. For another, our experience of the world is very rich, but our language seems very poor, uh, poor as a vehicle for capturing it. Most of our uh, phenomenal experiences outrun uh, our abilities to describe them. And the third apparent drawback of using language as a medium for developing uniquely human cognitive capacities is that languages have to be learned. So if you're unfortunate enough not to get the right kind of input to learn a natural language, it seems like you'd be in real trouble if your ability uh, to engage in this fast, flexible, productive learning uh, depended on language. Well, this is my last slide on the, la uh, the uh, language part and uh, uh, close to my last slide altogether. Uh, what I want to suggest is that these three apparent limitations of language are actually virtues. Uh, that what we want as fast and flexible learners is not that every concept in our repertoire flood into our minds every time we look at something to which that concept applies. It wouldn't be useful for our experience uh, if every time I looked at a cup, every way I could have of construing a cup, this is larger than my Aunt Sadie's cup, uh, this is redder than the cup I uh, uh, used this morning, etc. We don't want these thoughts flooding into our minds. We want them to come when summoned. So the slowness of um, language-based representations, I actually think, is a virtue uh, for learning, uh, uh, learning new concepts. But I think the biggest virtue is the fact that languages are learned. Uh, because there's a downside to having a highly flexible, productively combinatorial capacity. It gives us too many potential concepts uh, and a serious problem of deciding on any particular occasion what concept should I be calling on uh, to make sense of the events that are uh, taking place right now? Uh, now, if all of our combinatorial capacity were innate in us, that's a problem that infants would face from the very beginning, and it's hard to see how they would be able to solve it. Um, uh, however, if the language of thought is a learned natural language, then a couple of uh, nice things are going to happen. First of all, children learn language gradually, starting by learning the most frequent words of the language and then progressing uh, to less frequent words. Because adults tend to say things that they think are worth saying, the more frequent words are likely to refer, refer to the more useful concepts. So we will see children's uh, repertoire of concepts expanding gradually, uh, starting with the most useful ones. But the other thing is people tend to use language in contexts that are relevant. So as children are hearing uh, uh, words that are activating new concepts, they're doing so in a context which is going to be providing information about the uses of those concepts, the times when you'd want to be uh, uh, calling on them. 
So for both these reasons, I think that natural languages learned from others who say what they think is worth uh, uh, saying are going to be a really good guide to children in navigating through what would otherwise be the harrowingly large space of conceptual possibilities that become available to us when we develop this productive capacity for forming uh, new concepts uh, from the concepts uh, with which we began. So what makes us fast and flexible learners? Um, to summarize, I've suggested that infants start with a few core systems centering on interconnected uh, concepts that are abstract and therefore hard to learn. Uh, I think other animals start with these abstract uh, concepts as well. And I really hope that some of the wonderful resources of um, uh, this institution will be devoted to studying uh, their physical basis and their origin and growth uh, in animal uh, minds and brains. Second, it depends on a capacity for learning a natural language with an open-ended lexicon, a productively combinatorial syntax, and a compositional semantics, and um, a capacity for composing new concepts by using the expressions in that language as children learn it from other people who talk about the things that they think um, are worth saying. But I want to end by asking, why is this still a hypothesis? Why can't we simply do the key experiments that will let us actually uncover, um, uh, develop a deep and multi-leveled understanding of how it is that uh, our minds are capable of the, uh, the uh, flexibility and the inventiveness uh, that we see in uh, every human uh, culture? Uh, and I want to end then by pointing to some I think key limits of all of the research that I talked about. And I'm doing this not to be pessimistic, but rather to be optimistic, because I see alternatives. Uh, I see opportunities here to overcome these limits and develop um, a deeper understanding of human minds. The primary limit is that decades of research have revealed an awful lot about what infants know, but they've revealed a whole lot less about how they know what they know or why they know what they know. They've revealed less about the brain systems that support infant knowledge, and they've revealed less about the computational principles that can make sense of why infants start out representing some properties of objects but not others, or some aspects of agents' actions but not other um, aspects, and so forth. Uh, so, uh, so here are some of the questions that I think our current research doesn't answer. First of all, how do the core cognitive systems work? And can we build machines? Can we take the core knowledge we find in infants and put them into machines that will learn uh, and understand the world as infants do? Second, how do infant brains support uh, infant minds? Third, what ca causes the emergence of new systems of concepts? And can we understand those causes well enough uh, to uh, develop programs that will help children who have difficulties learning, uh, either because of uh, medical problems or because of lack of resources, uh, low quality schools, and so forth. Uh, what I want to end with is just by pointing to three new research directions that I think are wide open right now that I hope some of the high school students in the, this room uh, will be uh, inspired uh, to try to pursue uh, and that I think could be um, uh, really helpful in um, beginning to address these, uh, these uh, questions. One uh, is studies that join low-tech behavioral experiments on infants uh, to uh, computational modeling of infant minds uh, by um, uh, researchers in computer science, artificial intelligence, and computational cognitive science. Second, studies uh, using neuroimaging methods to image infant uh, minds and brains um, at work. And third, quite differently, field experiments, testing interventions aimed to move infants' knowledge forward in the normal, natural environments, the homes and schools in which kids actually learn, bringing research out of the lab and into the environments in which children learn. So starting with computational modeling, uh, let me um, describe this enterprise by just giving you a single example of a computational project that I hope is going to be uh, come possible in the next couple of years. Question. I told you that infants track objects when they move behind occluders uh, by analyzing their motions, in particular the continuity of their motions, but not by analyzing their colors, their forms, their features, their shapes, uh, uh, et cetera. Why do they do that? What kind of computational system would behave in this manner? Uh, now, Tomer Ullman um, 
uh, a computational uh, cognitive scientist, came up with a hypothesis. He said that infants may interpret object motions when they see objects moving in the world uh, by running mental simulations. They may predict what's going to happen next if, for example, they were to bump into a table uh, or put another object on a another block on a tower of blocks by running those mental simulations forward and imagining what will happen um, uh, in those events. In this way, uh, infants may uh, come to uh, predict what will happen in the world much as the physics engines that um, uh, are implemented in video games and Pixar movies uh, simulate uh, motions of physical objects for purposes of rendering those objects and creating realistic looking um, animated films. So we could ask, uh, Tomer asked, how do physics engines work? Well, interestingly, when a physics engine simulates the forward motion of an object, they, they actually, they don't use a full representation of all of the properties of the object that they've represented. Uh, rather, they develop a, a, a secondary, very crude representation of the object shape. So they might represent the object shape just as a bounding box that you could put around that little duck uh, or ball or apple or uh, whatever the object is. Uh, it's not that they've lost the information about the detailed object properties. It's just that in animating the event, you'll get a good enough approximation to the object's path of motion, speed of motion, uh, position at the next time step, simply by taking account of the gross global size and approximate shape of that object and its um, uh, position in space. Once you've extrapolated its motion to the next time step, then if the object is still visible, you can now add um, the uh, other features of the object back. Physics engines operate this way because it's simply a more economical way of simulating physical uh, interactions. But if it's more uh, economical for a machine, it also very likely could be more economical for a brain. And this could be why uh, we see the pattern of success and failure that we see in those um, object tracking experiments. So that's a, that's a hypothesis. It's a computational model. It makes testable predictions. There are other computational models of uh, physical reasoning that have been put forward. And empirical research on infants can test those models against each other by focusing on critical cases where they make um, differing predictions. I think these kinds of tests could shed new light um, on um, human cognition and cognitive development. Functional brain imaging. Now, I didn't talk about it today, but much of the work that's been done on human infants has been aided by research in neuroscience. Uh, some uh, research in neuroscience on human adults, uh, typically um, uh, using non-invasive um, functional brain imaging, but, but especially research on other animals uh, using a much wider array of techniques for studying um, brain structure and, bra and especially uh, uh, brain function. The problem is, though, if we want to understand what makes humans fast and flexible learners, we need to be able to image human brains, uh, human infant brains. It's not enough to image animal brains because by definition they don't have the capacity that we're looking for. Um, and it's not enough to, to image human adult brains because although they have that capacity, we know so much more. Uh, there's, it's not obvious in looking at an image of our brain activity what aspects of that activity are stemming from the mechanisms present in the infant and what's been added later on. We really need to be able to get in there um, uh, and study um, infants' brains directly. Happily, there's a whole bunch of labs that are uh, uh, trying to do this now. It's not easy, uh, uh, especially because you need babies to be awake, you need them to be solving tasks, and you need them to be willing uh, to sit still long enough to be imaged, but I'm optimistic that that's happening. And finally, how do we investigate the causes of cognitive change? Uh, most lab experiments, sadly, don't really get at causation. There are some studies, we've done some, other labs have done some, where we train babies in the lab and look at the effects of that training on their performance. But even when we do that, we're by training them under laboratory conditions, we're studying them in a very different environment from the environments that infants uh, and children actually learn in. Uh, so I think to gain a deeper understanding of human knowledge, we're going to have to go outside the laboratory and do uh, field experiments, getting at the causes of cognitive change um, in the environments where it happens. Uh, and this is an effort uh, that has been picking up steam 
uh, recently. I'll just talk about one uh, unsuccessful experiment followed by a couple somewhat more successful ones um, uh, that we've done uh, in a domain I didn't talk about today, number and geometry, asking whether we can enhance children's learning of mathematics uh, through activities that exercise the core numerical and geometrical abilities that we have as infants. So we ran a two-year field experiment in India uh, with a whole bunch of uh, children uh, who were randomized to receive games that involved play of the sort that infants are capable of all over the world, uh, playing with um, numerical and uh, geometrical displays uh, of the sort that are comprehensible uh, uh, to infants, but playing in social contexts that elicit language and symbols, therefore invitations to combine information across uh, core systems. Um, and uh, before and after, and for a year after that testing, we tracked children's progress uh, through school. Uh, our findings were, on the one hand, encouraging. We found that the lab uh, experiments were reproducible under field uh, conditions, um, and that children who played these games, like children who were trained in the lab, got better at them. Uh, but we also learned that getting better at lab-based training doesn't necessarily transfer to getting better in school. Uh, uh, school curricula that were built only on the lab, I think, would be very likely to fail. Our first experiment certainly did. On the other hand, once you've done your first field experiment, you can now iterate learn from your mistakes, and do better the next time around. And I'm quite optimistic uh, that just as we can get closer, uh, a deeper understanding through successions of experiments in the lab, we can do that in the field as well. Uh, so in closing, uh, I think there are three challenges that we have a chance of meeting in the years that come. First of all, can we understand the minds of human infants deeply enough to build machines that learn as infants do? This was the dream of the great pioneer um, Alan Turing uh, 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 60, almost 70 years ago uh, now. I think we might be getting to the point where that's achievable. Two, can we understand the uniquely human brain processes that support children's rapid learning of um, uh, new concepts? And third, can we come to understand how knowledge grows in children's minds and brains well enough to design uh, better ways to teach them? If you look at the current findings that, that uh, are available, the answer has got to be not yet. Uh, but if you look ahead, I think there's reason to be much more optimistic. Thank you. I think we have time just for a couple of questions. If there are, uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Lawrence. That's very enhancing. I, I, I'm just wondering, of course, this is all positive. You have a positive birth, but what about a retarded child? Is there any study? As because my, in my in my thinking, uh, if you could catch a retarded child right after birth and use some of the models in there. Can we help them? That's the point. I certainly hope so. And I think the more that we learn uh, about brain and cognitive development, the better position we'll be in to do so. My, I suspect that one thing uh, uh, that we're going to learn is that there isn't just one way to be retarded, that there's, I mean, we already know there's a whole planet panoply of developmental disabilities. The biology, the neurobiology of some of those disabilities is coming to be better understood. We still have a long way to go. Uh, but I do think that one of the hopes, I could have mentioned this and, and didn't, uh, but one of the hopes is not only that we'll be able to aid education, but, study. yeah. There's a really good decision kids today that are retarded and becoming a, a really a, a, a big problem. Yep, agreed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Have you done any, uh, any work uh, that would define the uh, temporal characteristics of these six systems in terms of uh, when they might be optimally learned by infants? Uh, yeah, um, yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful question. The answer is mostly no. I mean, if, uh, all of this, the systems that I, de the six systems that I described are present in infants as early as they've been tested for. Uh, when I talked about the things that infants couldn't do, uh, that developed later, it was because we had evidence of failure at an earlier time point at su and success at a later time point. For the six core systems, we don't have evidence for any time points where there's clear 
failure in human infants. What's more, for most of those systems, we have evidence for its success in precocial animals who can show them uh, at, uh, show these abilities at birth, or uh, altricial but controlled reared animals who show the abilities under conditions that didn't involve learning in the ordinary sense of um, uh, engaging with the things that you're trying to understand and learning from those uh, experiences. So I don't think that any of these systems are dependent on learning. On the other hand, I think all of them are functioning to support further learning. Uh, and there's a really important timing question there of w is there a best time to be learning, uh, enriching your naive physics of the world and learning about that, or to be learning about the social world, uh, or to be learning um, about actions and how to plan sequences of actions and so forth. I don't know the answer to that question, but I think anybody who's lived with young children would say that the preschool years are really important for all of those things. Uh, and uh, that success in school and later endeavors is likely to be greatly enhanced if you have a child who's developed a basic mastery of the physical and the social world, capable of learning from other people, capable of making basic predictions about how the world is going to behave. And also, if they've had their, curios you know, their natural curiosity, which is, I should have said this, the basis for all of our low-tech experiments is the fact that infants are curious. They want to look at things that are new. They want to understand why they made the wrong prediction and look harder and figure it out. They want to manipulate things and learn about them. So, so my, I would bet on the early years as being really critical, but I don't think there's, there's um, uh, good data on, on, on uh, uh, this point. It's systematic experiments that have shown that. One more question. Oh, so, oops. Uh. So you talk about children and systems, and when they're learning a, a new language, if they're raised bilingual, do they see the two languages as different systems, or do they see it yeah. as only one system? That's a wonderful. That's a wonderful. They... That's a wonderful question. Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, one thing I should have, I, I want to be really clear about uh, the properties of natural language that I think allow us. Uh, to learn in qualitatively new species mm -hmm. unique ways are universal properties of language. So it won't matter what language you're learning. As long as you're learning a language, you're gonna, you're, uh, you will, it, 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 all human languages have these three properties. They're all you know, comp uh, yeah. compositional and, and uh, with combinatorial syntax and open-ended lexicons and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, so any language is fine. Now the question, are, are two languages better than one? I don't know. Or uh, at what point can they differentiate between the languages instead of seeing them as only one? Right. Um, oh, that, that there's been a lot of work on. Okay. Uh, so children differentiate between their different languages very early. Um, there's evidence that, in part, they do this uh, using social information. In part, they use information that's specific the to the languages yeah. and their phonology and rules and so forth. But in part, they use social information. So the, the bilingual kids who do the best are kids who have specific people who speak to them in specific languages. So say, parents who speak one language and then a community that they go in school where they're speaking a different language, or one parent speaking one language and the other parent speaking a, a, a different language. That tends to be better. That tends to separate the languages for the kids. Um, the initial learning is a little bit slower uh, than for monolinguals. The final learning is equally uh, good in the two cases. And actually, by a number of measures, bilinguals seem to be at an advantage uh, on a variety of cognitive tasks. Though I doubt that's because of these combinatorial properties where, where one language uh, clearly seems to be sufficient. Great. I think that was the last question yeah, if there was time for it. Thank you. Thank you.